another case of the measles has been confirmed in the GTA, the latest in a person who passed through Pearson Airport. The details are coming up. A new report suggests that Canadians are waiting even longer for some surgeries than before the COVID-19 pandemic. And combating confusion and frustration today when it comes to Toronto's vacant home tax. Some homeowners are seeing red after they say they receive notices for failing to declare their occupancy status. We'll explain coming up. Good afternoon and welcome to CP24 Live at Noon. I'm Bakari Sad. And I'm Lena Latifat. Thanks so much for joining us. Public health officials have confirmed another measles case in a person who passed through Pearson Airport. The Durham Region Health Department says that people who were in Terminal 3 March 8th between 524 in the evening and 845 that night may have been exposed. It says that the virus was identified in an Ontario adult who recently traveled abroad. And passengers on Royal Jordanian Airlines flight RJ-271 may also have been exposed. Measles symptoms can begin up to 21 days after exposure. They include red rashes, red eyes, fever, cough, and runny nose. A new report shows Canadians are waiting longer for some surgeries than they were before the COVID-19 pandemic. And CTV Scott Hurst has more. Scott, good afternoon. Mm. What are some of the key findings in this report? Good afternoon, Bakari and Lena. This new report from the Canadian Institute for Health Information paints a troubling picture, particularly for those Canadians on these wait lists, as it appears they're waiting longer for certain procedures, particularly hip and knee replacements were one of the main focuses of this new report and of course it's not just people waiting it's when these people are waiting it means that their quality of life is much poorer as potentially they can't work or maybe can't do the things they like in terms of physical activity so let's dive into some of the numbers here the data shows that 66 percent of hip replacement patients had surgery within the recommended time frame of 26 weeks compared to 75 percent in 2019 for knee replacement surgery, 59% of people had the operation within that time frame compared to 70% before the pandemic. That's an 11-point drop. Now, the silver lining, particularly for us here in Ontario, at least, patients in this province waited the shortest amount of time for nearly all the procedures. However, it's a bit more bleak for our friends in the Maritimes. All Maritime provinces are well below the national average when it came to knee and hip replacements. Here's more from Dr. Pierre Guy, the president of the Canadian Orthopedic Association. We've never been doing very well. We've set a benchmark many years ago, over 20 years ago, that 90% of patients would be operated within 26 weeks. We've not met that, and I think uh, although we've made modest recent gains, just really we're not even back at the level pre-pandemic. So, Bakar and Lena, the big question is how did we get into this situation? Experts point to us still lagging behind from the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, that really tipped over the apple cart for so many different procedures. An ongoing staffing crisis in healthcare with so many people leaving the healthcare system and also pointing to an aging population where so many more people are in need of knee and hip replacements. And by having this data, the Canadian Institute for Health Information says it hopes decision makers can, can then help use that and factor that in to their long-term planning. All right, Scott Hirsch reporting live. Thanks so much for this, Scott. Thank you. Well, several Toronto homeowners, they are complaining on social media after receiving notices for failing to declare their occupancy status. Yeah, every owner in the city is required to confirm whether their property is being lived in or not. Every year, vacant homes are subject to an extra tax. Those who do not declare their status face a fine of just over $21. The original deadline to declare was February 29th, but that was extended by the city for two weeks to ensure residents had more time to complete the online form. Some homeowners say that they didn't know they had to declare, and some say that they did declare, but they got a notice anyway. And Councillor Josh Matlow joined us earlier. He called on the city to implement a new process to identify vacant homes and told people who have been wrongfully billed not to pay the vacant home tax bill. My advice to uh, those of you out there who uh, are in the situation where you have received a notice from the city that you owe money because you didn't uh, make a declaration uh, for uh, on the vacant home taxes, don't pay it. Don't pay it. Uh, you are going to receive an updated notice to inform you about the next steps. Uh, if you do have utility bills, proof that you live there, 
you know, certainly send it in. But uh, I do know that the mayor and city staff are working it, this out because there is a recognition that this is not done well. And staying with municipal politics, the city is hitting the brakes on a proposed stormwater charge that's been dubbed a rain tax by some. During storms like the one we're seeing today, all the rain leads to a lot of runoff, which can cause flooding on roads and lead to sanitary sewage going into the lake. City staff have been looking at creating a separate charge on water bills to pay for the stormwater system. It would be based on the hard surface area on a property like the roof or driveway. Mayor Olivia Chow says it's not a rain tax, but she is asking staff for more information. It overwhelms our water infrastructure. It causes damage to your home and the environment. I think we should make it easier for people to do their part by giving them financial incentives to plant a beautiful garden or install permeable pavement to help the rain drain. I don't think it's fair to have a stormwater policy that asks homeowners to pay while letting businesses with massive parking lots off the hook. That's why I'm asking Toronto Water to come back to City Council with a plan that supports more green infrastructure, prevents flooding, and keeps your water bills low. And the city's website says that consultation has been paused in order to allow staff to do further work to align the stormwater charge and water service charge with the city's broader climate resilient strategy. Well, speaking of rain, you might not want to put away that umbrella just yet. And we see a few showers or bursts of even wet flurries today, with especially that happening later this noon, because we're only going to hit a high of just three degrees. The normal is 8.6 degrees for this time of year. The risk of wet flurries tonight with light winds and dropping to zero. It's going to be mainly cloudy Friday with a few isolated showers or even wet flurries. The high is only going to be five. There will be some sun and cloud on a high of eight on Saturday, but brighter and warmer on Sunday with a high of 11. Now, those outside downtown Toronto woke up to some snow this morning. Maybe this was you. This is what it looked like in Peterborough as residents had to deal with about five centimeters of the white stuff. Buses in several regions were canceled, including in Simcoe County and Peterborough, Northumberland and Clarington. And police are asking for help to identify a suspect in a violent assault near Bloor and Dundas. They're hoping that someone recognizes the man you see right here. He was last seen Thursday around six in the evening. Police say that a suspect approached a woman who was walking her dog, grabbed her arm, started pulling her before assaulting her, and then trying to throw her onto the road. Witnesses intervened. The suspect took off. He's described as being 20 to 30 years old, 5'7", bald with a thin build. He was wearing a blue shirt with two black stripes, a red hooded sweater, jeans, and flip-flops. A Whitby man is facing several charges accused of luring a 14-year-old girl online. 33-year-old Jordan Hill was arrested yesterday and charged with five offenses, including luring a child for sexual interference and child pornography offenses. Police say an analysis of the suspect's phone confirmed that between February and March of this year, he requested its sexually explicit photos and inappropriate physical contact from the youth using Facebook Messenger. Investigators believe there may be more victims and they're asking anybody with information to get in touch. And Bill Police have arrested a man wanted in a stabbing in Mississauga. 34-year-old Brian Gracie of no fixed address was taken into custody this morning and a knife was recovered. He's facing charges of attempted murder and aggravated assault. Police say that Gracie was on release for failing to comply for probation orders stemming from several serious criminal charges. And this happened right around 3.30 yesterday at a plaza near Eglinton and Credit View Road. And police say that the suspect and victim are known to each other. The victim's injuries were initially said to be life-threatening, but he's been upgraded to stable condition. Niagara Region is preparing to welcome thousands of visitors to watch the solar eclipse. The region sits in the path of totality, and that means the sun will be 100% covered by the moon Monday afternoon, as opposed to Toronto, where the eclipse will be 99%. The region preemptively declared a state of emergency in order to better manage the crowds. Constable Phil Gavin with the Niagara Regional Police Service says they are redeploying resources to deal with crowds, but visitors should be prepared for traffic jams and long lineups. 
taking some time uh, planning uh, a route in and out. Uh, what are you going to do when you're on our way? On your way, if uh, you run into traffic congestion, that's uh, you know you, you could unfortunately be stuck in your car for four hours on the highway. And, and what does that look like? You have the family, the dog. Uh, do you have your medication? Do you have food? Do you have water? Do you have supplies? What are you going to do if you have to use the bathroom? So we're asking people to really stop, think about these issues. And Canadian Airlines don't expect flight times to be impacted by Monday's solar eclipse. Air Canada says that there will be no operational impacts, though it did issue a reminder to staff not to look directly at the eclipse. WestJet says that it's taken safety precautions and passengers hoping to catch a glimpse of the shadowed sun out the window should bring their own protective eye gear. Air Transat, meanwhile, will direct passengers to just keep their window shades closed. Coming up next on CB24 Live at Noon, breaking down another price bump at the pumps. Why we're seeing gas prices go up again? and how high they could be heading. Stay with us. The cost of gas has gone to its highest level so far this year. The price at the pumps across the GTA is sitting at $1.65 a litre. Analysts expect the increase to continue in the weeks ahead. Some are forecasting prices could near $1.70 per litre by the May long weekend. They're horrendous. Right. And it's getting to the point where it's too expensive to go to work. Uh, it's not good. I commute. I do 65,000 kilometers a year, and I just filled up this thing with high test at 203 almost. And Patrick DeHaan is the head of petroleum analysis at Gas, but he spoke to CP24 about the factors which are fueling the rise in prices. The uh, increase in the carbon tax, which uh, started just a couple of days ago, but we're also contending with the normal seasonality and prices. Oil now is at its highest level since last October, nearing $86 a barrel. That's partially pushing prices up across Canada and basically North America. The seasonality, though, has more to do with the switch over to summer gasoline, which is happening now. Demand is going up. We have a lot more travel as temperatures warm up. And refineries doing maintenance before the summer driving season starts. That's what's pushing prices up. Analysts have warned that the switch from winter to summer gasoline blends, that could also gas cause gas prices to climb in the weeks ahead. Well, Ford is delaying the start of electric vehicle production at its Oakville plant until 2027. The automaker had planned to start producing the vehicles next year, but says while work to overhaul the facility will start in the second quarter of this year as planned, the actual vehicle production has been pushed back. The Oakville plant employs 2,700 workers who are represented by Unifor. And Unifor National President Atlanta Payne released a statement which reads in part, quote, Unifor is extremely disappointed by the company's decision. Our members have done nothing but build best-in-class vehicles for Ford Motor Company, and they deserve certainty in the company's future production plans. I want to be very clear here. Our members can be assured that we will push the company to explore every single possible opportunity to lessen the impact of this decision on them and their families. The federal government has announced a new fund designed to boost affordable housing. The Canada Rental Protection Fund will provide $1 billion in loans and $470 million in contributions to nonprofit organizations and other partners to help them buy affordable rental buildings. The federal government says the new program will preserve rent prices, ensuring long-term affordability for lower-income renters. The initiative is based on a similar rental protection fund already in place in B.C. The Canada Rental Protection Fund will aim to mobilize investments and financing from the charitable sector, private sector and other orders of government in order to maximize the ability to acquire and protect affordable housing. A good proof of concept for this initiative is the BC Rental Protection Fund in British Columbia. They recognize that for every new affordable rental home that is built in their province, four more are lost to investors, to conversions, to demolition, and to rent increases. And this is happening in communities right across the country, which is why the federal government is acting today. When we see people who don't have an affordable place to live, they more often run into challenges in the healthcare system, which impacts the resources we put towards the strain system. They more often run into challenges with the law enforcement or the courts, which comes at a cost to all of us. 
and more often uh, fail to achieve their economic potential and are denied an opportunity to contribute their talents that benefits communities, not just for the individual who's looking to find a home, but for all of us. Now, we can help change that. And today's announcement at the Canada Rental Protection Fund, worth $1.5 billion, is going to put more housing in the hands of nonprofits who will not just ensure that it's affordable today, but ensure that it's kept affordable forever. And the new Canada Rental Protection Fund is going to be included in the upcoming federal budget. That is scheduled to be tabled April 16th. Taking a look at some international headlines this afternoon, dozens remain missing after a powerful earthquake rocked Taiwan. Search and rescue efforts continue a day after the quake triggered rock slides and damaged buildings. Some have been left tilting at precarious angles with their ground floors crushed. The 7.2 magnitude tremor is the strongest to strike Taiwan in 25 years. At least nine people were killed. More than 1,000 have been injured. The founder of the not-for-profit organization World Central Kitchen says the Israeli airstrikes that hit the aid convoy were not an unfortunate mistake. I know that everybody understands that food is a universal right, that food is not a weapon of war. Food should never be a weapon. And, and the airstrikes on our convoy... I don't think were an unfortunate mistake. It was really a direct attack on a clearly marked vehicles whose movements were known by everybody at the IDF. And I know Israelis. I have many friends that are Israelis and Jewish. I know Israelis there better than this war being waged. The attack killed seven aid workers on Monday, including Canadian-American citizen Jacob Flickinger. He was a military veteran from Quebec and joined the World Central Kitchen last fall. Flickinger had been working for the aid organization in Gaza since early March. A GoFundMe page is raising funds for a funeral for him and a trust fund for his one-year-old son. And people in Gaza continue to struggle to access food and water as it worsens. Aid agencies say cumbersome processes and Israeli inspections are slowing the entry of aid into Gaza. Israel says that it imposes no limits on food and humanitarian supplies. And yesterday, a ship loaded with humanitarian aid destined for Gaza returned to Cyprus after the deadly attack that killed seven aid workers of World Central Kitchen. The organization has paused operations in the territory following the incident. The UN agency World Food Program has warned that Gaza could be plunged into famine as early as next month. NATO is celebrating the 75th anniversary of the founding of the Alliance today. The occasion was marked with a cake cutting ceremony at the bloc's headquarters in Brussels. The celebration was attended by hundreds of staffers as well as NATO's top diplomats, including Canada's foreign affairs minister, Melanie Jolie. The original Washington Treaty that gave birth to the alliance was also in the building. NATO began with 12 members but has since grown to 32 and retaken a central role in world affairs following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We have helped to spread peace, democracy and prosperity throughout Europe. And today... We also celebrate important anniversaries for many of our members. Two world wars, the Cold War, and every challenge we have faced since then have taught us that we need each other. And a bigger anniversary celebration is planned for the NATO Leaders Summit in Washington. That'll be in July. Well, coming up next on CP24, live at noon, a renovated Rogers Center ready to go for the Blue Jays' home opener. We'll have more on the new additions awaiting players and fans when the team returns to Toronto next week. Welcome back. We got a sneak peek of the new look at Rogers Center today ahead of Monday's Blue Jays home opener. Yeah, the second phase of renovations happened over the offseason. It included an overhaul of the 100 level to shift seats towards the infield and bring fans closer to the action. The new seats also have cup holders. And, of course, there's lots of new food options. Those were unveiled during today's tour. I'm still waiting for our taste test. There are different offerings on each level of the stadium, and some of the new items include hot honey and maple battered hot dogs, loaded mac and cheese, jerk chicken, Parmesan fries, and even crush floats. Yes to all of that. And the Blue Jays were looking for a series win against the Houston Astros. 
sends one to deep center field. And that is his fifth career home run off Christmas. Jordan Alvarez homered twice for the Astros. The Jays were shut out for the second time in the three-game series. Houston beat Toronto 8-0. The Jays will visit the Yankees tomorrow. Yet another blowout <laughs> for the Raptors as they limp towards the end of one of the worst seasons ever. Timberwolves. Raptors hanging around here. And Edwards with the... They were in Minnesota last night. Anthony Edwards led the Timberwolves with 28 points, while Rudy Gobert had 15 rebounds. The Raptors fell 133-85. The 48-point difference is the largest margin of defeat in franchise history. It's lost number 15 in a row, just too shy of the club record set in 1997. They'll visit the Bucks in Milwaukee tomorrow. How heartbreaking. Yeah, well, coming up next on CP24 Live at noon, another housing announcement expected in Toronto this afternoon as Mayor Olivia Chow joins Deputy Prime Minister Christopher Freeland. More details coming up. Combating confusion and frustration today when it comes to Toronto's vacant home tax. Some homeowners are seeing red after they say they receive notices for failing to declare their occupancy status. We'll explain in moments. Another case of the measles has been confirmed in the GTA, the latest, and a person who passed through the airport. We'll tell you what you need to know coming up. Finance Minister Christian Freeland is in Toronto this afternoon to make a pre-budget housing announcement, joined by Mayor Olivia Chow. And we'll take you live there as soon as that begins. Good afternoon and welcome to CP24 Live at Noon. I'm Lena Latifat. And I'm Bakari Savage. Ontario Education Minister Stephen Lecce is in Oakville this afternoon making an announcement. Let's listen. ...publicly funded schools by focusing on literacy and math and raising standards across our province. These actions are critically important for creating rewarding pathways into good-paying careers for our kids. And so with that, I say thank you to the amazing partners, to our advocates, to AMO, of course, to our school boards, public and Catholic, English and French, all of whom encourage government to build faster and invest more so that we can renew our schools. So thank you to you all. And now with that, Ontario's Minister of Finance, Peter Bethenthal. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Minister Lache, and thank you for everyone for joining us uh, here today. Really uh, honored that you could be with us and all of you. You know, before I, I get going on some remarks, I just want to uh, tell uh, again everyone I dedicated the budget last week to my father. And he came from overseas as a young man and uh, had the dream of leaving war torn Europe to, to build a new life. And you know what he needed to do that, and by the way, he's turning 94 today, so happy birthday, Dad. I'll see you a little bit later. But that 19-year-old who came to this country in, uh, in 1949, you know, he just wanted the opportunity to get an education, to, to get a job, raise a family. He ended up having three kids. And you know what those three kids needed? They needed a school. So we can't welcome people from around the world without doing things, Minister Lecce, that you're doing, and through your leadership, and accelerating the building of infrastructure like schools and daycare spaces, childcare spaces, is so critical to having that same dream that my father had all those years ago uh, for the, everyone else here today. So thank you. And you know, it's not just about more schools. This will also benefit teachers, our great teachers right across the province. Uh, my grandmother, uh, my mother's uh, mother, who came from uh, living in everything behind in Hungary, she was a teacher to my daughter, who's a teacher, to my cousin, Janie, who's a teacher. You know, this is an important part of the support for education, and our future is our education and our children. So I couldn't be more proud to be standing here with you today and about the things in our budget that are helping to build Ontario and invest in things that people need, like more schools, affordable housing, hospitals, transit, highways. Because over the next 10 years, we've put forward a budget of $190 billion of capital to build things like these schools so that we can accommodate our population growth. Just last, uh, yeah, a few days ago, last year, we learned that our population grew in Ontario by 533,000 people. It's almost a million people in two years. You know, how are they 
How are they going to get around? Uh, how, are they, uh, how, are they, how are they going to be able to afford a home? And where are they going to go to school? So we're talking about the critical infrastructure and long-term assets that will make Ontario stronger in the long run. By building schools and other key infrastructure, we're heading off uh, economic slowdowns. We're boosting prosperity and productivity for all and fueling economic growth. We have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to build more. And as Minister Lecce said, build faster and build the things that matter most. And folks, we can't afford to wait. We're leaning into education in Ontario so that our kids have every advantage they need to succeed for generations to come. Like my father, who came all those years ago and had three kids and his son standing before you today. I want that same dream for everyone, all 16 million people that call Ontario home as the best place to live, to work and raise a family. And that's what the 2024 budget is all about. It's our plan to rebuild Ontario's economy while supporting workers and families and businesses, a place where you can get a world-class education and get a better job with a bigger paycheck. And I'm so happy to be uh, standing in front of you with so many skilled trades and workers and some people who build these things, uh, because these are good jobs and they're bigger paychecks and guess what, they're secure jobs and they're growing jobs. Because you know, Stephen, we're not stopping with this announcement today. We are going to keep going. We're going to be making announcements right across the province uh, to build more schools, to build more highways, to build more transit, to build more hospitals, long-term care. We're going to do it around the province and we're going to make it so you can feel safe and secure in your community, to make it feel like a better Ontario. We're getting it ready to build and I'd now like to welcome one of our partners in getting it done, the Mayor of Oakville, Rob Burton, to the podium. Thank you very much, everyone. What a great day for education this is in Ontario and in our town. $1.3 billion of investment in new schools is a great leap forward. Our growing province needs the 60 new and expanded schools that this investment will create. I'm grateful for the support for new schools and good education. All for right, our kids. the Ford government Mr. making Mr. an education Mr. announcement Mr. in Oakville, a significant education announcement. Uh, it will be investing $1.3 billion to support the construction and expansion of 60 schools across the province. Uh, the PCs say this will create about 27,000 student spaces. I believe the education minister is going to be taking some questions, so we'll take you back to that press conference as soon as that happens. Well, several Ontario or Toronto homeowners are complaining on social media after receiving notices for failing to declare their occupancy status. Every owner in the city is required to confirm whether their property is being lived in or not every year. Vacant homes are subject to an extra tax. Well, those who don't declare their status face a fine have just over $2,100. $2 the original deadline to declare was February 29th, but it was extended by the city for two weeks to ensure residents had more time to complete the online form. Some homeowners say they didn't know they had to declare, and some say they did declare, but they got the notice anyway. This is a nightmare for all the Toronians um, owners. And uh, um, this is, uh, we, even though I mail it by Canada Post on the February 28th, I still received this notice and it said I didn't declare. So this is incredible. How, uh, who am I blaming? Is Canada Post or is them? And they are not doing their job properly. We just got this in the mail and then we nobody told us about it. And then you open the mail and you see that there's a big budget thing that you have to pay for. And nobody had given us a notice beforehand. There was nothing really given prior to it, like notices beforehand. And then you see this and now there's a huge lineup of, of people having to go and figure out where the money is going to go. And Councillor Josh Matlow joined us earlier and called on the city to implement a new process to identify vacant homes, as well as telling people who have been wrongfully billed not to pay the vacant home tax bill. We need to have a process that doesn't depend on people every single year having to either remember or to be prompted to make a declaration. Um, there should be a way to identify, for example, through the utility bill is one idea that's being bandied around where, you know, if, if you've got, if you're using electricity and water, that should suggest that somebody is living there. There should be some way to be able to do it other than 
what is clumsy, messy, and clearly is really uh, becoming this unfair and very uh, punitive approach that the city is taking. And public health officials have confirmed another measles case in a person who passed through Pearson Airport. The Durham Region Health Department says people who were in Terminal 3 on March 8th between 524 and 845 p.m. may have been exposed. It says the virus was identified in an Ontario adult who recently traveled abroad. Passengers on Royal Jordanian Airlines flight RJ271 may also have been exposed. Measles symptoms can begin up to 21 days after exposure. They include red rashes, red eyes, fever, cough, and runny nose. A new report shows that Canadians are waiting longer for some surgeries than they were before the COVID-19 pandemic. The Canadian Institute for Health Information found that 66% of hip replacements were performed within 26 weeks in 2023. That's compared to 75% in 2019. 59% of knee replacements were done within that time frame, as opposed to 70% before the pandemic. Hip fracture repairs were done within 48 hours for 82% of patients last year. That's down from 86% in 2019. And the president of the Canadian Orthopedic Association says Canada's aging population is a major contributor to longer wait times. They wait in pain or they uh, and then when they wait in pain, sometimes they require uh, narcotics. And we are much more sensitive as a society in avoiding narcotics. But those are we have limited uh, options to um, solve the problem. It's been decided at that point when somebody's on a wait list that their solution is going to be a surgical uh, solution, and they've tried other things. So, um, so, so that does mean people waiting in pain, uh, not being able to carry out their daily activities. The report did show Ontario patients had the shortest wait time for nearly all procedures. Okay, it is raining out there in case you haven't been. Uh, You might want to, you know, just hold on to that umbrella just a little bit. Uh, Let's check with Agile NCR Bois to see how the rain's affecting the roads. Ag. Yeah, a little bit of light rain, not as heavy as it was yesterday, so that's a little bit of good news. And if you're headed out, you might come across some ponding and pooling. Again, drive with a bit of extra care. You're also going to come across some problems impacting the drive, Bakari, on the westbound lanes of the 401 in the collectors, uh, just on the approach to the 400. Cruise on scene of a collision involving a transport truck. It is the two left lanes that are blocked. Definitely seeing a delay from before Keel on the approach. Also problems if you're traveling on the Gardner westbound trying to get out of the downtown core. It's just a stalled vehicle mainly off to the side but partially in the left lane. So that's adding to your slow drive. It's busy on the eastbound side on the approach to Park Lawn. We had a collision in the left lane. Situation cleared. And if you're on the Don Valley Parkway, still soggy and pretty slow north and southbound as you travel between the 401 and Lawrence. Outside of camera view, crews on scene of a collision on the 407 eastbound ramp that takes you to the northbound 400. The right lane of that ramp is blocked. I'll send it back to you, Lena Bukhari. The CP24 Traffic Report is brought to you by CapitalDirect.ca. We are going to take you back to Oakville now, where the Education Minister, Stephen Lecce, is speaking after making an education announcement. Uh, $38 million in total, supporting, you know, roughly 600,000 meals and snacks. So we're proud of the work we're doing in Ontario in partnership with the Student Nutrition Program, the volunteers, the many seniors that run this program. We are grateful. Uh, Look, we welcome federal contribution. We want it to be enduring and sustainable, and we want to reach kids quickly. So we look forward to hearing more details from this announcement I know was originally committed to in previous campaigns many years ago. So let's get the dollars at the door. Let's work together to help more kids and make sure that children can go to school um, with a nutritious breakfast. I think in this country, we could all agree we want that for every child. And we are a compassionate government. We're investing more in this respect. We'll work with any level of government and our school boards to make sure that we can support more families in need. Thank you very much. And follow up, uh, the, the Fed say the, uh, the money will support existing uh, provincial programs. So what work has Ontario done to identify which schools and which food programs will get the funding? Well, we have a program in roughly seven in ten schools today. Wherever there is a need, we have nutrition programs. Those are running actively daily. Um, And, of course, we look forward to getting more details from the feds. They made this announcement uh, just days ago. They've yet to release much of the details. When they do, we'll be working with them lock and step to get those dollars out the door to feed more kids, make sure that in this amazing, prosperous nation, every child can get to school with a full nutritious breakfast. I think we could agree that's the basic expectation of our community, of our school boards, of our government coming together. Um, so we look forward to working with them and our school boards to get this, to those dollars out the door. 
Good afternoon, Minister Walter from City News. I want to switch to a different municipality. Um, the Toronto District School Board says they are faced with a structural deficit. Um, is the province going to allow the board to lift the moratorium on school closures so they can consolidate um, and use the $16 million proceeds to generate uh, by a sale of surplus property? To that gap. You know, one of the big priorities of school boards has been uh, the need to build more schools. And so today we're focused on building more schools for the people of Ontario with a more than doubling of the funding. Our Premier is sending a message to communities across Ontario that we're going to do a better job and move faster and smarter to build for the future so that kids can learn in modern STEM-focused schools. That's our commitment today, to build new schools. Um, and so we're going to focus on that for the time being. We'll obviously work with all school boards. Uh, we expect them to uh, do what every board is doing, which is coming up with a balanced budget, uh, uh, and that's uh, that's our expectation. But having said that, today I think will be good news for every board in Ontario, as communicated from their own associations, Catholic and public, that this is a positive step forward, building modern schools, investing more funding so that we can build better schools, new schools in Toronto and, frankly, in small towns and big cities across this province. That concludes our press conference. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. So from one press conference to another, that was Education Minister Stephen Lecce speaking. Now we're going to take you live to Mayor Olivia Chow speaking. And finally, she connected with an organization and discovered the city of Toronto have an organize, uh, have a fund called multi-unit residential acquisition program. Instead of being evicted and being anxious all the time, she was able to now feel totally at home and secure, knowing that she will have uh, forever affordable housing rental housing. I went to visit her unit and she was so proud of her unit that she bought new furniture, um, not very expensive, but color coordinated. And the, the sigh of relief and the pride she have of the, the homes that she now has because of that security, because it's now um, belong to her and her neighbors through an organization called WICOM. And interestingly enough, as I arrived to this building, I met a fellow called Wade, who's here with us. And he lived in a building on Girard Street for years. He moved in in 2007. And that Girard Street unit has, they have 20 units. And it was very, it was feeling quite unsettled because the building kept being sold. And finally, when St. Jude are able to purchase the building through the same funds called Mira, I asked him how it felt. He said, wow, it was great news. And the, the relief is phenomenal that he will not going to be ever facing renovations, demovictions, evictions of any kind. He can now secure, uh, have a secure home. You know, in Toronto, we are losing affordable housing 14 times faster than it is built. I am so grateful for the federal government and the Deputy Prime Minister today announcing the, um, the program where the tenants are going to be protected. The $1.5 billion loan and the $500,000 grant. What that means is that for people like Juliet and her son, and people like Wade and her and his neighbors, they're going to be able to secure their homes through land trusts or cooperatives or with an organization. They could now say, this is going to be my permanent home. I wouldn't have to feel so insecure. We know that there's a real sense of anxiousness 
in all the tenants that are in Toronto, and that's 50 percent of the population. And with this program, <clears throat> the federal government uh, combined with yesterday's uh, low-cost financing program that was announced by the, uh, f um, the Prime Minister and the Minister's announcement of the Housing Accelerator Fund, we are finally turning a corner just like spring has arrived, and it's going to be a spring full of hope because it means the tenants and the renters and people that wants to purchase a home or to be able to afford their rent will finally begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel because it's been hard, it's been difficult, it's been a hard journey. So this Canada Rental Protection Fund <clears throat> will get <clears throat> Excuse me. This Canada Rental Protection Fund will get housing back on track, not just in Toronto, but across the country. We can protect affordable homes, empower renters, give people the security of keeping the roof over their heads. And we are going to together build a city that's so much more affordable, um, safe, caring, where everyone feels they belong. So thank you, Prime Minister Freeland, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland. Whoops! <laughs> I didn't say that. Erase that. Okay. <clears throat> Let me try this again. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland. <laughs> Allow me to introduce you, my great friend, uh, right here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mayor Olivia. And um, the last time Olivia and I were together was last Friday, um, the Good Friday procession um, through my riding, which the mayor lives in. And we had uh, done the announcement on Wednesday in Vancouver um, of support for renters. Um, and then we had done an announcement on the Thursday. Um, I was in Winnipeg of more support for child care. And then I saw the mayor on Friday. We were walking in the procession and she said, I'm glad you guys are doing stuff on renters. I really hope there will be something more for affordable housing. And if there is, let's announce it together. So... Madam Mayor, here we are. Um, your wish uh, is my command. Je tiens tout d'abord à souligner que nous sommes réunis sur les territoires traditionnels de nombreuses nations, notamment les Mississaugas du Credit, les Anishinaabeg, les Chippewa, les Haudenosaunee et les Wendat. Um, I am really, really glad to be back in Toronto after tra back home in Toronto after traveling around the country a bit. Um, this is my second Toronto housing announcement this week, which is great. Or my se sorry, the uh, my second Toronto announcement this week because we announced school food on the Monday, um, and I'm really glad to have two of my Toronto caucus colleagues. Uh, Rob and Julie with me. Um, we've worked together for a long time and housing is an issue both of them are so deeply committed to and that really we have worked together as 416 Caucus on together with the city. Um, and it is really nice to have a city councillor, Chris, here with us too. Um, I also want to thank Ray Sullivan and the incredible people of St. Jude Community Homes. St. Jude runs a number of community housing sites in Toronto's downtown. Today, we are at one of the buildings they operate on Parliament Street, where there are 24 affordable rental homes for women, Indigenous residents, seniors, people with disabilities, and people experiencing or at risk of homelessness. There are built-in supports here and across all the sites that St. Jude operates, like meal programs and other services to help residents with their mental health and well-being. Um, I was really moved by our tour of this building earlier today. Uh, Annie Setien, who works here, gave us the tour. And she was really speaking, um, 
I would say with great empathy and compassion and respect about the people who live here. And she talked about how hard she and everyone who works here tries to ensure that everyone here has the support they need to feel good about themselves, to get back on their feet, and to build a good life. Um, she talked about things like being sure we, the mayor and I um, and the team were shown around an apartment that someone is moving into. All right, into. Mayor Olivia Chow and Deputy Prime Minister Christopher Freeland making a housing announcement in the city today. This after the feds announced a $6 billion national housing program and a renter's bill of rights. You're watching CP24 live at noon. Thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. We'll be right back with more news. So that they can choose.